welcome everyone to the Governance and Operations Committee meeting of June the 12th, 2023. Um, members of the public can be present. On both places. <laughs> Okay, I'll Go start over now. Members of the public can be present in the council committee room during the meeting, and alternatively, they can uh, join and observe the meeting via Zoom. Uh, please note that the webinar is being recorded and published to the city's YouTube site. So today we have a delegation from the regional district of Kootenay Boundary Manager of Emergency Programs, Mark Seconds. So I'll hand the uh, meeting over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen so that I can just have it forwarded for you. All right. Well, well, thank you very much for having us here today. Um, so I'm Mark Stevens. I'm manager of emergency programs for regional district Kootenay boundary. Uh, to my left is Carlene Pierce, who's our emergency program coordinator and fire smart coordinator for the regional district. And together we make up the emergency program um, at the regional district. Um, so today um, we're, like, we're asked to come um, by um, Councillor Martin and Director Martin from the RDKB. And to give an overview of what uh, the elected official's role is during an emergency. So what we're doing today really only scratches the surface of, of what would be your responsibility and, and emergency management um, in, um, in the regional district and in the province. Um, we'd be happy to come back and provide uh, more, you know, more context in certain areas if there are certain areas that you wish to have more information on. Um, or if you just want us to send you more information, we can also do that as well. So we're going to start off today with emergency management, uh, just a quick overview about emergency management in British Columbia. I will warn you that emergency management is very heavy in the acronyms, so that's why I provided you this big list of all the acronyms that we use. If I don't spell something out right away the first time, just let me know and I'll, I'll read through it and uh, you can have that for your reference after the fact. So emergency management in BC is governed by uh, what is essentially five pieces of legislation, starting with the Local Government Act and then going through the Emergency Program Act, which lays out the responsibilities within the province. Uh, the Emergency Pro uh, Program Management Regulation, which is the overall structure of the provincial emergency program. The Local Authority Emergency Management um, Regulations and dis uh, Compensation Disaster Financial Assistance Regulation. So this package of what is five um, acts and regulation govern how we act and, and all the role, all the duties that we do within the province. Um, part of the Emergency Program Act Section 8, Subsection 3 is what actually uh, makes us responsible for, or makes the local authority responsible for emergency management. It says that uh, the emergency, uh, local authority must um, by way of bylaw, establish an emergency program, and and then that's what we have here. So that's the RDKB in this case. So we have bylaws that um, establish the program and service, and then bylaws that have the city of Trail uh, pass that responsibility on to us on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And then within there, it also says that we have to conduct a hazard risk and vulnerability assessment or an HRVA, and that leads into the development of an emergency plan. And then from that emergency plan, we must exercise it. We must operate it in an emergency. And then post-emergency, we must review it periodically and update it accordingly. And so that's the overall cycle of, of legislation with that. Um, the role of the province is, uh, is much more, um, more conduit for us. So in the emergency uh, program, we deal with emergency management climate readiness, the new ministry. It was formerly emergency, uh, EM, EMBC, emergency management um, of British Columbia, and now it's EMCR. 
And so we deal with them directly as our counterparts, and that's our conduit into the province. So if we need to reach out to the province for something, we'll we'll go through them, and they'll link us into the appropriate channels. They may uh, they may reach out to federal agencies or even international agencies for support if it's a larger event. Um, and so that's not our responsibility. In our role as emergency management, we take the inputs from the local scene. So either the fire department, the police, paramedics, could be tech, could be uh, your public works, things like that. Once the situation becomes too much that they can handle, they call in the emergency program. We step in to provide overall site support, reaching out to the province to um, seek financial support, seek, um, seek overall subject matter expert support, depending on what it is. Um, and then it just escalates from there. So if the province can't provide that, they reach out to their counterparts at the federal government and so on up the chain it goes until we start getting international resources. So as an example right now, the wildfires, you're seeing places like uh, Alberta reaching out and getting people from uh, firefighters from South, uh, South Africa and European Union, things like that. That's that system that is at work. So the local fire department couldn't handle that situation anymore. So they reach out to provincial wildfire resources they were exhausted, so then they reach out to federal, and that's where we have the interagency transfer. So BC and others sent some to Alberta, and then from there, those were exhausted. And they needed more, so now they've reached out internationally, and they have those agreements in place for you know people from Australia or South, uh, usually you know Southern Hemisphere um, countries to come and support that way. And that's how that system works. And it, it's the exact same in, in no matter what emergency that we deal with, it would be that same process of, of hierarchy that way. So common complaint from the public is that it takes too long to get those resources, but it's a very defined process that needs to be done in order to make sure that we're requesting those at the right time and, and all that. So you will have heard on the radio that BC already has requested fire resources from international aid for international aid for this fire season, as they're predicting it to be a, an aggressive one. Um, and so they're kind of putting themselves in the queue for those resources when the time comes. Uh, the other thing, so as I said, we, we look for the province for is that subject matter expert support. So whether that's a, a geotech, um, hazardous materials, urban search and rescue, things like that. Uh, we also look for funding approvals. So something called an EAF or an expense authorization form. So during an emergency, anything that is above and beyond what your normal expenditure would be during that event is eligible for a claim with the province. And so if it's beforehand, we can fill up the proper paperwork with once the EOC is activated and we can send that to the province, they can approve it. It's not a blank check, but it is a it is a uh, no, it is a, a, a statement that yes, this this funding is eligible. And after the event, we can go through the, the details of it and get some or all of it reimbursed um, to the local authority. And then we can also request resources. So that's where fire trucks, um, um, helicopters, things like that can actually be requested. If the province actually owns those resources, they can send them in. An example of that, of that is this year we requested um, two new high capacity pumps that uh, BC Wildfire has in their possession to actually pump out a beaver dam uh, that had uh, was at high risk of failure this year on Crown Line. So we worked with them to bring those pumps in in order to uh, in order to pump that down. Um, so when we talk about emergency management, emergency, it really is a cycle of events. So it starts with our response. Uh, the response is what we need to do at that moment to stabilize the situation, reduce loss of life, reduce suffering, reduce property loss, bring that situation back into control in order to um, in order, in order to uh, stabilize it and essentially make it better. It, once we are done the response or, or partway through the response, we often start the recovery process from that. And that is largely um, it can be community level, it can be financial level if it's just something that involves a municipality. But it usually starts during the event. We're trying to build back to a situation where our community is roughly the same as where we were before. It's difficult to build back better with the system that we have as as what we see for response costs is that they're not eligible to be long-term costs. For example, if we're looking to place riprap in a stream because it's eroding into critical infrastructure, if the province approves that during the emergency, we actually have to take that out after the fact, after the emergency is over, and then apply through the proper permits and processes to reinstall that same works. And 
all of that is funded in and out is funded by the province but it's not just a put it in and you're done with it sort of situation so the recovery is really to make our community get it back to where we are or where we were before before the event not better but not worse for sure uh, can involve psychosocial support for communities and businesses uh, can involve um, actual physical work to rebuild roads uh, it can just involve re-entry of people back into their properties if they're on order after the recovery we move into the mitigation and prevention phase so this is where we really we've learned from the event and we start to look at what we can do to prevent this from happening to us again and this can be grant funded through large-scale protections uh you can think of grant forks with the flood work that they've done that's a good example of that they applied for 55 million dollars worth of federal or provincial grants in order to rebuild their dike system and make sure that that doesn't happen to them again and that's what they've done there it can be can take into account fire smart to look at fuel breaks and large-scale fuel treatments on crown land or private land um, that really anything that is going to help you get to a point where you're more resilient um, for the next response and then in that process we also move into preparedness so this is where we just start building we mitigated now we need to make sure that we're constantly prepared this is messaging to our public to be personally prepared so that it makes it easier to respond to events it can also be for a municipality or a local authority to make sure that they're prepared for events, training for staff, updating plans, uh, practicing, exercising, things like that. And then we move back into a response. And so as much as it is a, a cycle, it is also a very linear process that often happens at the exact same time. So for example, here, this diagram kind of lays it out more linearly. And so we start with our, our HRVAs, and we move into a pre-incident phase where we're in mitigation and preparedness. And then we have an incident that moves into response and recovery. Mitigation can also be continuing on through that in some instances. And then we move into our post phase where response has stopped, preparedness has stopped, but our recovery is continuing and our mitigation is continuing. And then we learn, we go into there and we start this continuous improvement process and that leads us back into the other side again. So that's a very high level emergency management in BC sort of overview. And now I'm going to get to into what our RDKB emergency program does. So our goal uh, in emergency management in uh, the RDKB is to provide a comprehensive emergency management program that includes assessing and mitigating risks and planning for response and recovery. We maintain and update emergency plans that uh, that is compatible uh, or that is complemented by training and exercising. Uh, we also work co co cooperatively sorry, with member municipalities, neighboring local governments, uh, uh, local regional governments, and provincial uh, response agencies uh, in order to build a holistic program that can respond at a moment's notice. Uh, some examples of that are that we issue lots of training notes um, and free courses for member municipalities. So we send that out on a regular basis to them, um, such as the City of Trail. And, and when people are able to capitalize on those, uh, we let them, we get them to do that, sign the paperwork, and then we have them entered into our training database that then allows us to have this larger pool of uh, trained people, responders that can come into an EOC and help. So, for example, if we're not having an event in trail, we're having one in Grand Forks, for example, like this spring, we may reach out and talk to City Trail to see, hey, are you able to spare a few people in the planning side or in the operation side, things like that, in order to build out a whole, uh, better process for everybody. All right, so the meat and potatoes of it. Elected officials, what are your roles prior to an emergency? So before an emergency, uh, this time where we're in right now, we really want you to be a, a, you know to alert staff of any any hazards. So it, it's very common for uh, for you to be reached out to by the public. Say, hey, I saw smoke up on the Paulson over there when I was driving back from Christina Lake. What should I do about that? So being aware of what you're, what they can do, where to direct people to, um, and it can be as simple as in some cases notifying Colin, the CAO, to let him know that he's seen that. He can then pass it up the chain of command to us. It can be getting them to call nine one one, call the fire center, directing them to the right resource. Um, and, and if he, and if you don't know, then you know, reach out and ask what to do, and we can get that sorted out as well um promote our alerting system is a big one um so we subscribe to buoyant alert buoyant alert oops my apologies buoyant alert is a um a private company that we contract to um to provide this service we're able to 
um, issue about 2,000 alerts um, per minute with that system for people that are signed up. We are able to, um, to alert on telephone lines through text or voice. Um, we can do it through email, through, um, and through the app as well. What's nice about the app is that this company is now the, the biggest provider in the province of these systems. And so if you have the app for trail, it will also work in TNRD. It will also work in the Fraser Valley. Whoever has this system, it automatically works as an alerting node. So your phone is always pointing out to the server that you're right here. And if you need an alert, I'm one to get one sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very powerful system that way. What's also nice, it's anonymous. You do not have to give your name if you don't want to in order to get um, in order to get access to the system. It's different than the alert ready system, the broadcast intrusive system that the province has. It's that's a non-opt-in, that's a that's a blanket system. The issue with that system is it goes by cell towers. So for example, if we needed to provide an alert to Warfield, the cell tower that would do that would actually alert all residents in trail as well. And so the confusion that can happen from that can be quite big. So we like to we are prepared to use that system, but we prefer to use ours and have people sign up for that. We have very good subscription over on the boundary side because of all the events over there, less so on this side. So very good role for, for like officials to play is to, to point people to this and, and the benefits of registering for it. Um, promote personal preparedness. That, this material that we've, uh, we've provided you today. So this is just a sampling of what's out there. Unfortunately, a lot of it from the province is on back order right now. We're waiting for new stock to come in. Um, but we are able to provide you as much of this resource as you want. If you want to, we usually have some on hand uh, just to give to municipalities just to hold you know, for tax season time to have some of the front counter sort of thing. Um, and, and you can go as far as having a, a mail out of everything if, if that's what you wanted. Um, however, we have seen that costs with that tend to be cost prohibitive. <laughs> um, but that's a good way to promote that personal preparedness um, mentality. Um, and then the biggest one is to have a personal, uh, personal plan yourself. So if you have a household preparedness plan, uh, it'd be good to, you know, to put out on social media that you've done this. I know for our family, we have, uh, starting May 1st, we have two totes to live by our front door. One is with uh, two days of clothes for everybody in the family. Second tote has some, some essentials, uh, paperwork, important paperwork, passports, insurance, papers, things like that. Uh, we have two days worth of um, food in there that we can get by. We have some some cash that we can um, be able to purchase fuel with if power's out or things like that. Dead machines are down. Um, and then we have some toys and things like that. We have pets, have pet food and a carrier, things like that. Me and my role, I'm usually the ones that are that are first into the EOC. And so we need to I need to make sure that my family's taken care of because that's the role that I need to play. And so with that, we have our plan that we know where, where my wife and family will go. They will grab the grab the two totes and they're off. Another big thing that we also saw, unfortunately, this year up in Port St. John is gas in your vehicle. The number of people that drive below half a tank is astonishing, especially during wildfire season. And that causes a big issue when you are asked to leave immediately and you need to uh, need to go to um, you need to go to uh, Dawson Creek or somewhere far away from that. Um, it is it, so it, that's one thing that we've been messaging over the last little while is to make sure your tank is full above uh, above half. Um, um, so in the Ardikidi, we have two emergency operation centers. We have one here in the city of Trail, and we have one over in the boundary. Our primary one is here in the city. We generally don't like to have these in the city that you're actually having the emergency in, so that's why we have two. They're meant to be at an arm's length from the actual site that is responding to the event in order to allow for, uh, for better coordination. They're not public facilities. They are operational facilities, and so when they are in the community, you often get lots of community members coming into facilities for updates, and so we tend not to, not to appreciate that the high work environment, and it can be quite distracting. Um, we do have, so we do have three levels of activation. We have a level one, which is can be a break from monitoring, um, you know, freshets or fire season uh, to a small event, uh, uh, apartment fire, or one, usually one jurisdiction, one or two agencies responding sort of thing. That's where we can step in and help. A level two is a more moderate. So you might have a couple of sites spread out around your area, more than two, more than two agencies assisting with that and um, possibly a few evacuation orders. 
And the level three is where you have multiple sites, multiple agencies, and multiple evacuation orders. So this year, spring or evacuation orders this spring, that's what we were on um, over in the boundary was a level three EOC activation. We had about um, we had about 15 people working in the EOC and then also a few remote site operation posts throughout uh, the boundary as well. Um, how that works is the first person who owns the EOC is the director. Um, and then they usually have if we're if we're activated for death wildfire, we usually get a call from DC Wildfire saying, hey, we're gonna need your support with evacuation of its orders. If it was something that would be affecting the city of Trail, I would then reach out to um, your CAO, who would then notify the policy group, which is which is in the trail, the mayor and council of this municipality. Um, and then give a brief description of the situation. If it's if it's just requiring a little bit of work, then it can be a smaller activation. We might request some support in terms of planning or or GIS work. Um, could be uh, public works for road closures, things like that. They would uh, they would help support that um, uh, that situation, and then we just ramp it up as we as we see fit. Uh, that's what's good about the EOC model is that it's easy to scale up and it's easy to scale down in a hurry when we need that. Once City of Trails exhausted their resources for people that can assist with that, that's where the regional system kicks in and really shines because we are able to pull from the RDKB staff. We're able to pull from Midway, from Grand Forks, from Rochland. We can pull these people in to assist and build out a bigger system if we need it. So we're not constrained like in some smaller municipalities that way. Um, so as a policy group, um, you'll be contacted. Um, uh, um, You'll be sitting uh, right up over here in the uh, in the org chart, um, reporting directly to the CAO, or if the CAO is not present, to the uh, EOC director. And, and you can see from the EOC organization chart here, it can be quite big. We don't need to activate all of these different pieces at one time. They can be different sections that come on at different at different points. The the theory behind it is that. If you don't have all of them activated, the next level up has those responsibilities. So, for example, if we don't have a planning section, it would fall under the duties of the direct the deputy director of the EOC or the EOC director. Um, if you do, then it's just the chain of command from there. Um, so, as I said, we have two EOCs in Trail and Grand Forks. Um, they are well equipped to handle our emergencies uh, with backup power. Um, and they have uh, backup radio communications, backup internet connections. They have uh, enough supplies to maintain comfortable staff capacity for a number of days if we aren't able to leave with food and sleeping quarters, sleeping arrangements and things like that. Um, so this uh, flow chart that you see on the right is for uh, is for how we activate, how we go through the decision of activating the EOC. And it just provides us that little bit of um, clarity as for what we do in that in those situations. And so as a policy group, um, this uh, this graphic came from our emergency plan. So this tells you what your role as a policy group is. So we're gonna feed you inputs either from the, from the EOC director, briefing notes, uh, sit reports, uh, public information material, media releases. You're gonna take all of this information uh, you're going to digest it. You're going to consult. You're going to um, you're going to assess it, evaluate it, prioritize it, and you're going to make decisions to really through the risk management and policy group liaison to the CAO, um, what your policy direction is on something, what your limit expenditure is. So, for example, during the event, we will have to follow your policy and procurement pol your procurement policy. And with that, if we need to go above and beyond that, then we're going to need to get your support for that. And so that's what uh, those are there for, is for you to, to do those. We may require a state local emergency. So um, in those events, we'll be coming to uh, your CAO to have the mayor sign up or the, or the acting mayor signing a state local emergency to access some powers to allow us to do some work. Most commonly, that's evacuation orders. If we are asking people to leave their house for more than an unreasonable amount of time, we need to issue a state or local emergency to keep them out. First one is good for seven days, and then we need to renew them every seven days after that in order to get those permissions. You are able to select different powers. They can be right from um, uh, forcing people from their house, like an evacuation order, accessing or, or entering property. So, for example, in Village of Midway this year, we needed to, uh, to set up some HESCO bins, some large baskets that hold sand to direct floodwaters. 
we needed to set those up on private land. And so that required us to have a state and local emergency to go in there and do that. Um, we may ask, we may activate the policy group um, to um, advocate for us at the provincial level. We've done that in 2018. Our director and mayor um, over in the boundary, they they reached out to the ministers to advocate for us if we were having a hard time getting responses on things. That can be another, um, another piece there. During big events, we're also going to be looking for a spokesperson. Someone that, that wants to step up to be a spokesperson for the policy group and for the city from that side of things. We do have an information officer that helps give the uh, briefings and things, but it also is better when it comes from an elected official who is in the know. It's going to be like drinking from a fire hydrant, from a fire hose, unfortunately, during these events. It's a lot of information that comes at you very quick. Um, and, and, but it, it, we try to make it as easy to digest as possible, and we try to get turnaround on decisions as fast as possible with as much information as possible. Um, so, yeah, there again, uh, a couple of, uh, of, of roles that we're going to need you to do is um, it's a really the main one is really just be knowledgeable of the situation at hand. Read the situation reports that we send out. Um, I believe maybe you have had the chance to see a couple of those already. Take a look through those we, um, to get uh, get the information because you will be contacted once again by constituents to say what's going on. You know, I've heard this, and really we ask you to direct uh, direct those residents to official sources, um, whether that be the USC um, information officer, uh, our Twitter feed, uh, which would also be your Twitter feed, Instagram. Uh, we'll use all of those all those items as well. Um, uh, so one thing I wanted to highlight is our duty officer program. So we, we have a 24 hour way of being contacted. Um, and so all of our municipalities, public works, fire chiefs, uh, MERS services, they all have this, 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 uh, these numbers in our phone, uh, in their phones, and they're able to contact us 24 hours a day if something arises. Um, we've gotten calls at two o'clock in the morning about flooding. We've gotten calls at nine o'clock at night about wildfires. That's what that system is for. And, Unfortunately, we have to phone people like your CAO at, at uh, all hours of the night as well to let them know the situations. We've had to do that with other things as well, but um, it's important to have that information so that nobody gets caught off guard with things. Um, so emergency communications. So for us, we have our dedicated emergency website, which is emergency.rdkb.com. When we post things, when you see a, a note go out on social media about an evacuation order, we've already posted it to our website we, we really strive that that's the first place that everything is updated so that everything feeds into there that residents can always get up to date information there this year we did and i feel like we did a very good job of communication during the, the fresh out event in the boundary and uh, i think it, it shows by the fact that we actually had very little phone calls into the eoc Normally, we're, we're processing multiple calls an hour looking for information on sandbag stations, on evacuations, things of that nature. We, during the peak fresh at, we, um, we stacked up with an actual call taker for someone to, that would be their only role, and they took four calls during the whole day. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a testament to our information officer and how much information they're putting out. Um, once again, directing people to the right sources. It is very easy, and I'm sure you've heard it already, the conspiracy theories and the rumors that get going during emergency events, whether it's wildfire or floods. It, it, it is rampant on social media. It happens quick, and so we really strive to have that information out in a timely manner and at regular intervals, as well as redirecting people to the official source of it. And so we also have um, some social media. So we have Twitter, we have Facebook, and we just got on Instagram this year. And then we also have our evacuation alerting system that I've talked about already. That's a great way of just making sure that you're aware of if you're in an order area or alert area in a fast in a fast way. We also use local radio quite a bit. And then we also use police, fire departments, search and rescue to hand out orders um, and deliver those if need be. Um, so I talked briefly about evacuation orders. So in Province of British Columbia, every resident is entitled to 72 hours of support if they are forced from their house for an emergency, whether that be from a structure fire, um, a flood, a wildland fire. We, are, we provide this support from um, other legislation. It can be extended if it's a prolonged situation like a flood or a wildfire, um, but it starts at 72 hours. We contract this service out to the Canadian Red Cross. They have two teams for us. They're called personal disaster assistance teams. 
They have one located in trail and they have one located over in the boundary. And so they're able to spool up to provide this support for people um, in order to uh, get the services we need. So we have a number of local businesses that are signed up as suppliers, whether it be for clothing, for food, for shelter, incidentals, things of that nature. People are able to take their vouchers there and, and get support that way. So we have a number of local, um, local businesses that are signed up for that. They're always looking for new volunteers. So if you know of anybody that's interested, they would, they would love to have new volunteers with that. It takes a little bit to get onboarded. Um, but we have found that you know, some volunteers really like to do that because it also allows them to travel overseas. So some people have actually worked with the Canadian Red Cross in, in Haiti, um, in, in uh, Nepal, in Eastern Canada, things like that. It allows you, affords you the ability to travel and, and meet some great people and, and help a lot of people out with the process. Uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight was our evacuation mapping. So we uh, we strive ourselves on having a very robust mapping system for our evacuation. So we have pre-identified all properties within the RMKB as having an evacuation zone. And so uh, what you're seeing on the screen here is, is Glenmary 2 zone, which is overall zone 17 for the RDKB. And it has a rough population, has a rough number of of houses, and so we can very quickly get this information out to our responders in order to assist with an evacuation. We are required by law to hand deliver where safe to do so evacuation orders, and so that's what we do. But with that comes reporting requirements that we need to make sure that we know where people are, we know where minors are, we know if people are staying or if they're leaving, and if they're leaving, we need to tell them where they're going. And so that's what this system really allows us to do. We also have an app that clicks into this that our responders can utilize to, so we can actually get real-time data back in the EDOC as to where these, um, these evacuations are, are, are occurring and how it's progressing. And that's what I have for you today. As I said, this really just scratched the surface of what emergency management is and, um, and, and what your role is as elected officials, but we'd be happy to come back and, uh, and further the conversation more in any given area. Thank you. That was a lot of information. <laughs> yes, I know. No, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if Council has any questions. Councillor uh, Benson? I do. Ahead. I have three questions. Um, you were, you, when you talked about, you're talking about evacuation orders that you hand out mm -hmm. once you get a state of emergency and what, what one of those has to get redone every seven days? That's the state of local emergency. Okay. Yeah, so the state of local emergency provides the legal authorization to make to get someone out of their house for a prolonged period of time. Okay. And we and I will say that we we face a lot of uh, I don't say good pressure to make sure that we are only doing what we need to do. We, we strive to get people back into their houses as quick as possible. When we issue an evacuation order, we often we will notify the RCP so they step up patrols if they don't have the resources. We, we um, do an EAF for private security to do those. So we're making sure that we're protecting people's property because we know that it's a big ask for people to um, to leave their house and, and trust their secure, that security with us. And so that's why we, we take that very seriously to put that in there. And then I downloaded the app this morning when mm -hmm. I was on your website. And it's I like that you can put in like a couple of like different locations and do you, if both of the locations are within the RDKB, do you recommend so like a lot of people have a place at Cooney Lake or mm -hmm. Christina Lake plus here? Would you recommend putting those places in as well? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. So for example, for myself, I actually have multiple pins. So I have my my address, my actual home home address, I have my work, I have my wife's work, I have my kids' school, <laughs> and I have my parents' place. And so anytime there's an evacuation order or alert affecting those locations. I will get notified of that. Okay. So for example, if you had a, a place at Christina Lake and you put one there, if it's just affecting Christina Lake, it will notify you of that. Okay. But if it's also affecting your house, it will identify it as such. Okay. Yeah. And then finally, I was I was looking on the uh, the question I get a lot, and I'm sure others do as well, is about cooling centers when there's mm -hmm. like a heat dome or something. Uh, and I reviewed the policy on, on cooling and warming centers. And I was just wondering what, how are your finding do you have any like current pain points that you want to yeah so that the cooling centers are a very interesting thing um so we talked about at the beginning the legislation that that tells us what we are responsible for and so when we look at new responsibilities that are being handed to us like cooling centers were in 2020 2022 um 
we really don't have that authorization in there to open them. Right. They have been identified through, you may have heard this HARS document or Heat Emergency Response System. It's a, a CDC document that was developed um, with local health authorities and some subject matter experts from um, uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, uh, BC Housing, things of that nature, without any, re any representation from local authorities. But it also directs local authorities on how they should respond to these events. So we have some concerns with how that process went and that we would like to have a voice. If we're being asked to do certain things, we'd like to share our commitment and how we can best support because some of the things that they say in there, it's just not feasible for a local authority to do because we don't have the, the capacity or the resources to do that. Um, and so, you know, it is known and it is stated that it, it is a, a cooling or a heat emergency is a public health issue. And so the Public Health Act comes into play there. And so that's why we ask as part of the policy to be ordered to help mm -hmm. because that provides the connection. We can be ordered by any ministry to help. That's happened before with us when we pumped out the beaver dams, we were ordered to do so. Um, this year we had a structure almost enter the, the river uh, outside of Grand Forks and we were looking for an order to be able to respond to that one if it was that we had to take down, unfortunately take down the structure, we would be looking for an order to do that. And it's the protection at that point to the local authority to make sure that you're covered under the basis, because there's a lot of questions. So um, right now, it's just a policy that, that says that you're eligible for expenses. That policy can change at any time without any constitution. And so theoretically, you, you could outlay for cost and how the, how the billing works for that is that the city, so if the city of Trail was going to fund a cooling center, um, you got maybe consult or connect with a, a third party or NGO, uh, a local NGO would run that center. They would send you the bill. You have to pay that before submitting your invoice for the claim. And so if you go and click, well, you've, you've paid that, you've now gone and submitted your claim, and they say, well, this, this, and this, and this aren't eligible. Now you have to go back and try and recoup your money or write it off as an expense. And so what I can say is that claims are very complex. For, uh, for example, a claim that we had for $160 to the province had about 80 pages of documentation on it. It takes uh, multiple CPAs at the regional district to build these claims in order to submit them to be successful. So it's very onerous on volunteers of nonprofit NGOs who may not be a CPA or have that experience or training to build those in a way that are successful through the process. And so it becomes very risky for municipalities or local authorities to undertake those actions because then you have to write, you could potentially be writing off a large process. For example, um, I know one regional district ends up writing off tens of thousands of dollars in damages caused by um, caused by individuals at a cooling center in 2022. And that's unfortunately not an uncommon occurrence. And so, um, so that's why we're looking for the order is that it allows some of that, some of that clarity around things. Another one that we that we have concerns about is liability around worker safety. So if you open up a cooling center, or if we open up an evacuation center, we would contact the Red Cross. The Red Cross would come in. Their volunteers are trained in de-escalation. They're trained in in crisis management and things like that. They're also at that point. They're also covered by WorkSafe through the task. And so by doing that. If they, someone gets hurt, there's no liability up the chain at that point because they're all covered and they have the training. So if you if you contract an NGO, now we have to say, okay, are, are they trained? Do they have the training? Do they have the capability of doing that work? And there's still some gray area around who's responsible for the worker safety and for the liability of that. Is it a contractor situation? Because in cases where that's the case, we hear that NGOs and third parties don't want to take that part on. They want to be covered under the local authorities work safe, which then we talk about onboarding and, and reporting structures that are necessarily the same. And so it's really opened up um, a lot of a can of worms in terms of how we have to figure all this out. I think with the new modernized EPA, I think a lot of that will be flushed out and clarified. And I think that's when, that, when it will really shine. I think there is a need for, for cooling centers. Um, I think there's multiple parties that play a role in that. BC Housing for Vulnerable Population play a big role in that. Interior Health plays a big role in that for, um, for people, other vulnerable populations. And then 
theoretically, if everybody is being taken care of with those systems, there's not very many people that would actually access a cooling center. We have data from some of our counterparts who have done uh, opened up centers, for example, in Creston in 2022, and they had one person over the course of five days show up to that. And so they had lots of expenses for that. And so you know, you got to look at that. But would they be better served from just having cool public spaces published to say, okay, you can access a, a cool place to sit down and, and internet at you know at the waiting room of the or the uh, the waiting room of the hospital or or any other public space, you know, maybe it's the arena that opens up and things like that. So I think, uh, it, and then we also have to play, take into account the different levels of emergency, right? We have lots of heat warnings where it's warm for a couple of days and we get that around here. And I think most people know how to handle that. But we do also have those, those areas that are, are extreme heat and, and are quite risky, whether they're prolonged, they're through day and night. And that's where we need to work collaboratively to to really find a solution to, to go through this. But I think that lots of that comes from the EPA modernization, emergency program act modernization that is coming this year. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Thanks so much for coming today. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate the information. Not a problem. Anytime, happy to <laughs> happy to come and give a presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I now have downloaded the app. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Put back together. <laughs> well, you're welcome to join us for the rest of the council meeting as well. Oh, uh, we got some pressing <laughs> things that we're going to want. I think we'll get to it. The hell the next year first. <laughs> Thanks again so much. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the grant from AIDS um, sponsorship. And the uh, one we have before you today is the Trail and District Arts Council request for in kind cash contribution. I don't know. So the information is before you. Uh, any questions or concept? Um, uh, question. Um, it was for uh, some labor and equipment. Mm -hmm. If it's not, if it's more than that or less than that, did they adjust based on, or is it at that amount they? No, I, I think it's just a, that's sort of what we expected okay. as time goes. So okay. To move us a little more. It's just the fact that they won't be doing something else for the city. Right. right. They'll the be city. doing. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So and just uh, further with that, the um, we were asking the city a trail for in kind support in 2023 to clean up the mural across from uh, the Bailey Theater. On the parking lot area. On the parking lot, yeah. So that they can prepare it to fix it up. And the city owns the parking lot. Yeah. Okay, um, I I don't have any questions. I know that we've okayed this before and they've done a great job down there cleaning it up and repairing it. And so um, I would be willing to make that motion that we um, consider or uh, provide $3,650.99 in kind donation to the um, Charles Bailey Theater, the Trail and District Art Council. Second up. Seconded by Councillor Hansen. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll call for a gentleman. Councilor Benson. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you, everyone. 